then we will get started. Welcome, my name is Robert Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Urban Research Teaching and Outreach at Marquette University. This is indeed a continuation of our Wednesday discussions uh, under the umbrella of March on, comma, Milwaukee, in which we are taking the opportunity to explore some important topics in the history of the city and connect them to today, largely intended to make sure that we are providing a whole range of co-curricular and, and curricular materials and options for our young people and our educators as well, but then also to just talk about the rich histories that have shaped uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Want to make sure to send a shout out to Heather and Kristen uh, for all the work that you all have been doing to make sure that we continue these. So thank you so very much. Um, Adam, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Adam Carr. I'm a guy sitting in his backyard on the south side right now. Um, I grew up not liking history because I never learned any of the stories that mattered most to young people in Milwaukee. As an adult, I've started learning those stories a little bit and that lit a fire for me. That's become kind of my life. Um, and I'm, I'm involved in this because I care about young people not being having those stories robbed for them for the subsequent generations. Lisa, why don't you introduce yourself? We have a, we have a guest moderator today. Um, my name is Lisa Lamson. I am currently a PhD candidate in American history at Marquette, and I'm also a lecturer in African American history at the University of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And unlike Adam, I, I always liked history, even if I dabbled in other things like accounting. Um, it's a terrible choice. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to sort of guest moderating and facilitating this conversation. Awesome. So here's what we do, folks. You all know who, those of you who've attended these on previous Wednesdays, we don't wait for the ending of our conversation to engage the attendees and the audience. We want you all engaged in this process right away because we have some dynamite folks who are here with us today and, and we want you to engage with them as much and as regularly as possible throughout the process of our conversation. Today's conversation, Latinx Women Voices, Intersections of Culture and Activism. Uh, we, are, we are excited to welcome three remarkable women who are doing remarkable stuff in our city. Uh, Celeste Contreras, Stephanie Rivera, Bruce, and Tammy Rivera. You're gonna hear from them and they're gonna tell you what they are all about, but why don't we give them a minute just to say hello. Celeste, you wanna say hello to the folks who are visiting with us today? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Celeste Contreras and I am an MFA candidate at UWM right now at the Peck School of the Arts and I'm focusing on print and narrative form and I've been doing activism since around the age of 15. Um, I, I grew up loving history but I was thirsty and hungry for the truth and so that's why I became an activist. I wanted to know things that I knew my teachers weren't telling me and um, my high school career I spent battling the U.S. history teachers and getting kicked out of my economics class weekly. So um, I'm so honored to be here to talk about all those things that made me an activist. Awesome. Thank you so very much for joining us. Stephanie, how you doing over there? Hi, how's it going? Um, it's nice to see you all. I'm so sorry. I'm like running a little behind schedule. Um, we certainly understand. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us some stuff. Go ahead. Tell you some stuff. So, um, so my name is Stephanie Rivera. I'm um, Berrus. I'm in the philosophy department um, at uh, Marquette. Um, but um, yeah, so I I joined the Milwaukee community about two years ago, actually, um, and uh, I joined right um, as a result of my. Uh, coming to Marquette. So my work is largely uh, revolves around uh, doing intellectual histories, right? And my focus is Latin America and the Caribbean, um, as well as um, 
focusing on the amplification of voices within the continental United States um, of Afro-descended intellectual uh, women that often don't make it into the philosophical canon um, and things of that sort. So that's my kind of the work I do at the intellectual level, um, extremely interdisciplinary and I'm really not bound to the idea of philosophy. Um, I think that in order to do philosophy, we need to be doing a lot of really other, other types of work that are part of it. So that's what brings me to uh, on the ground act activism of different sorts. I think that in order to do good work that centers the importance of context and ideas, we also need to be in those contexts, right? Um, and that that's part of what it means to do philosophical work. So a little bit about where I'm coming from. Cool. Tammy, welcome. Buenas <laughs> tardes. Uh, I'm Tammy Rivera. I'm currently serving as the executive director and the lead organizer for Southside Organizing Center. Um, like Celeste, uh, I remember my first sort of activist actions um, in group um, as a teenager, but I remember being very vocal as, as a child in some instances defending my, my mother from uh, social service agents. And so I just see it as part of my divine calling, the way God created this creature to be of purpose on this, on this earth. Awesome. Adam, you want to talk to us about what we're going to do with these images. We want to get our panelists warmed up with some some cool images from the um, Chapman Hall takeover. For sure. Yeah. As was, uh, you know, so what Keisha just put on the screen here, these are going to be the three sections of what we're going to cover here. If you are watching either in the Zoom or in the Facebook, do feel free to write a comment or a question at any point. There is obviously a Q&A section at the end, but you can jump right into it. So Keisha, next slide, please. So these are just a set of questions. I'm gonna, let's let them sit on the screen here for just a moment to soak in. I'm gonna sh shortly bring you guys into a uh, suite of images from 50 years ago. Um, actually almost exactly 50 years ago, which is something that uh, of a, a remarkable story in Milwaukee that if you didn't, as Celeste meant before, if you didn't go out and learn it on your own, you may not know it. That's a spoiler alert. They won. Um, so we're going to go through these images of the Chapman Hall takeover. I'm just going to go through the first section here a little bit. Um, the Chapman Hall takeover t happened when uh, in 1970, the 20 or so Latino students at UWM went to the chancellor and said, you are not serving us. He said, well, too bad, get out of my office. They eventually snuck into his office, used his phone to call their friends who then invited community members into stage an occupation of his space. Um, this is what it looked like. So that's actually, we're gonna go through this in four different pieces, but I just wanted to start with these images and with that, um panelists i think that this is the last one talk a little bit about what these images uh invoke for you well I, i'll start i had the honor of staffing the 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of the chapman takeover uh with the legacy leaders who were still with us and are still with us at that time and so uh what does it mean for me i'm actually i got my undergrad my master's and I did my doctoral work there. I'm kicked out of the program. Now I'm trying to fight to get back in. So anybody who has influence at UWM. Do we um, need to take over the office again? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm working on that. And, and of course um, that will be a tool in my toolbox if I don't get in with diplomacy. Um, but uh, what does it evoke from me um, that uh, we have had a struggle for a long time and it's not different than what we're experiencing um, in 2020. And so a lot has changed and nothing uh, as what it means is we have to stay in it. And that's what this reminds me of. You know, we first began to, we as me and Adam began to do some lectures with uh, high school students and it was the young people at the Bell Phillips Center who taught us how to be more effective. And what they taught us was that when we engage them with historical artifacts, 
when we, we, when we engage them with images and ask them to become historians themselves, it's a much different conversation. As you all are looking at these images, uh, let's dissect them a little bit. What, what stories are the images themselves telling either directly or indirectly related to the takeover? Tell us what you see. And so audience, I'll, attendees, uh, do the same. Go right ahead. Um, so I'll jump in real quick. Uh, some, my immediate thoughts uh, when I looked at these images, and I, I've, I've seen a few of them already from before from last week, because um, I watched, um, is the fact that uh, it's it, where these, these images are, taking, are, are taken in a place, right? And this is a, a university. Right. Um, what we're looking at are images of a place in a university, and it's a, it's a, I think, uh, certain regards a much needed reminder of the fact that activism um, in the U.S. Um, historically, but also globally, um, has been and can be rooted in universities. Right. That you, that if we can think of universities as actually being learning communities um, with reciprocity in certain respects, right. Um, they also can fuel some really beautiful activism, um, even in as, as like people occupy them. So that my first thought is about the space, right? That this is a university, right? And that that sends a very particular message about the role of education, right? The relationship between activism and education um, and that those things are linked, right? And they're always linked, even if we don't see those links um, kind of upfront. Awesome. Celeste, what are you thinking? Well, I think what I see right away is that it's, it's a family. It's not just, you know, university students. It's, you know, I see children in there. I see elders. I see people who look like a lot of our family members. And I think they're there because of a bigger reason. They want to be seen and, you know, known and felt that they belong there. And I think it just goes to show, like, don't mess with us because we bring everybody, you know, in a big way. Like, we bring the whole tribe. And, you know, like, either let us in or we're bringing everyone. And I think that resilience is completely evident right now in what's happening in our streets in Milwaukee. And I think we are still begging to be seen and to know that we, are, we belong here. And as a Latina in UWM, this is like fuel and fire that I need right now because I don't always feel that, but I know that I belong there. And, um, you know, I just think this, these photos speak, there's thousands of stories within these images. And it's like, where do we start? Where do we end? It's beautiful. One note on this image, you can tell that this is in Wisconsin because this is a can of Sprecher. And these are two crates of milk. <laughs> like that's so Wisconsin right there. Um, why don't we move to the next set of images? Thank you all for that. Just another thing that shows the time. This is a reporter on the chancellor's phone because she didn't have a smartphone then or didn't have her own cell phone. That's just a really interesting piece of time. So. You know, that the, a lot of it happened, as, as Stephanie was mentioning, it's very place-based. It also moved out into the rest of the campus. I didn't notice this before. Look at this boom box right here. Oh, wow. Um, great. So That's not, great. so let's just look through. So boom box, but then also people making music with themselves and with their instruments, folks hanging out, having, look at this pot. What do you think's in there? Mm. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so this, you know, this looks like campus. This is them. Uh, so this is a group looking for Spanish speaking texts in the library and not finding any. I think a very clever, witty, um, this is them at the library still looks like this, right? Um, this is in the financial aid office, basically showing that the services, the, uh, well, one of the services of the campus, but many of the services did not cater to Spanish speaking folks. So, okay, what are you guys thinking about these other images as the protests spread into the landscape of UW Milwaukee on the east side? Hey, Adam, let's get Lisa into this conversation. Yeah, sorry. What's going on, Lisa? <laughs> What's going on over there? Talk to us. I was particularly struck by both Stephanie and Celeste's comments around community and place. Um, 
with such a small population, um, how, how does this sort of connect to claiming, I guess, of not only Milwaukee as home, um, but also this, the university as something to attach to? Uh, if you have any thoughts, that was sort of what struck me out of both of your comments. Tammy, you can too. I think it's really strategic too, seeing, I, I feel like this movement, they're using the, the platform of UWM and they're using their own sort of rules and, you know, who they dict or who they, um, who they are assisting in the community. And I think they're using this to sort of backfire. They're using UWM's own words against them because they're pointing out you're not serving this community. You're, we're here and you're not serving us. And I think, you know, pointing out, like going to the library and find, trying to find Spanish language books and um, going and seeing, you know, an application. How does everyone apply to this when we don't all speak English as our first language? And so I think it's really smart how, how smart activists can be when you really hone in on the details that the, in, that the society is using against whoever, and then using that as the, the fuel you know, like just right here, this image is just so, it's so profound because they're just, they just want to apply to school, you know, like the United States, like we want to go to school if we want to, we want to have that option. And I think it's just so smart that they're using, you know, this, the sort of system against the system that implemented it in the first place. Mm -hmm. It definitely okay. represents that that uh, you have to demand justice, and so the there is a myth, you know, that that uh, demonstrations or takeovers or physical, you know, um, uh, protests were passe about a decade ago. But the truth is, we have never had any substantial change in this nation without this type of activity, and so without this, the change doesn't happen. And, and uh, for all the university was professing before that time, um, and all the allies were promising, and the enemies were threatening, it didn't take place until the people demanded it, not even ask permission or appeal. It's a demand, you know, power is not shared. Uh, power is something that is negotiated. And so for me, it tells us, as I said earlier, like, this is what had to happen. This is what has to happen. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Stephanie? So there was an image, um, the image of um, people on congas, I think, earlier. Yeah, let me, let me get that one for you. Did you get that? <laughs> there you go. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, and I mean, there were other images also that had instruments in it, but um, I think these also, I mean, so this particular image I learned last week from um, Dr. Sergio Gonzalez um, is probably is a very emblematic of the cross between what was happening here and the links to Puerto Rican migrations to Milwaukee, um, represented by the, you know, the instruments tell us a lot about who's, who's here. Um, but it also makes me more broadly, like broadly speaking, what it kind of links me into is the history of um, uh, music in general and the role that music plays in uh, revolutionary struggles more broadly, right? And the way that things like music, and in, in this instance, if we're thinking about um, Puerto Rican, it's going to be Afro-descended music, right? Sounds that themselves stretch us over to West Africa, if we come through the note of the Caribbean, right? Finding themselves on the campus of UW-Milwaukee, right? Um, as being really impactful, but also reminding that there's a there's a local but global stretch that can happen 
as a result of things like, or the placement mm -hmm. of things like music and sound. And then I'm also very, very quickly reminded of more contemporary things, right? If we think about the Ricky Renuncia movement last summer, where um, music and dance played a really, really important role in, um, in, the, in the move to, to get the, the governor out, right? Um, and so these are all linked histories in certain regards. And I think one of the ways we see it threaded is with music, right? Um, and this this image being one of them. I'm thinking about Ooh. downtown right now, the county courthouse and the free Vaughn block party that started. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Days, oh, bouncy yeah. houses, air mattresses. There's that yes. tent with dudes playing yes. 2K in it. Like that yes. is that yes. is joy as a form of resistance. Yeah, absolutely. I was actually um, just down there yesterday and um, uh, with a group of, a, a collective of um, Latinx folks and, folks interested in combating anti-blackness anti within the Latino and Latinx communities. And, um, and we brought um, revolutionary salsa with us. We were like, yeah, no, this is like part of what this means is like we can do this linking through the ways that we attach into the struggles of anti-blackness within our community. And for that, uh, one of the things we do is we look to music and it's actually music from the 60s, right? It's salsa that comes sure. out of the 60s um, and the 70s.